Uh, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we are continuing our study of this Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. And I was actually, I'm going to start tonight. Interesting, interesting way to start part 15 or whatever part this is. Um, just to clarify. You know, oh, yeah. And don't look. Don't look at the board yet. Um, that's that's coming. Um, but just to clarify what's going on here. So, you know, this Buddhist tradition that we're involved in studying, of course, has this plethora, a plethora of sutras. These uh, teachings of the Buddha, stories of the life of the Buddha, um, there are many of them. And so we are actually reading from and have been reading from a, uh, a collection of sutras. It's actually an anthology of sutras that's called the Ratna Kutta Sutra, the, the heap of jewels or pile of jewels. Uh, a kutta is actually a, a peak. So, like, so there's so many sutras that they create a, a mound that peaks a kutta and they are like jewels so it's this jeweled heap and it is a collection of some 49 small sutras put together in this kind of collection and the entire anthology the entire ratnakuta collection has not been translated into english a, a large portion of the Ratnakuta Sutras have been translated into English in this edition, which is called A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. This was published in 1983. Um, and in addition to the sutras in here, there are a few other of the Ratnakuta Sutras that have been translated into English separately. And again, in, uh, to date, the entire Ratnakuta, all 49 of them, are not in English yet. So you have a, a variety of uh, translations for some of the sutras. Other sutras, you only have one English translation. And so within that collection of sutras, the 45th of 49 sutras is this one called the Bodhisattva Akshayamati Sutra. And that's what we've been reading for a while now. And the, actually, the reason why I'm going through this preface and kind of clarifying the sutra that we're reading is to tonight we are, or th this is the night, by the way. <laughs> this is tonight is the beginning. I don't know, but this is the beginning of why I wanted to do this sutra is because it's a sutra that talks about these 10 bodhisattva stages. They're called the Bhumi stages. This is an idea that's very present, very prevalent within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. We're going to talk all night about the Bhumi stages. They happen to appear, these 10 Bhumi stages happen to appear at this point in the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. And interestingly, it's, it's, it's funny how these things happen, you know. Um, these t these ten bodhisattva stages. Well, let's let's just get into this, shall we? <laughs> so these these are the ten bumis, as they're called. Uh, that word bumi, I've, I've written it here on the board. This word bumi is here translated as a stage. Um, I've, I've drawn our Bodhisattva Akshayamati kind of on his platform. That is sort of, this, this word, this tonight just actually might be an hour and a half on the word Bumi. It might just be that. We, we don't get to anything else. Who knows, right? Yeah, Eric's like, yes, please just talk for an hour and a half about the word Bumi. But <laughs> so... I'm a, I, you know, I love etymology. I love hermeneutics. I love language. I love words. I love knowing what words mean and where they come from. And so a, a really great way to 
approach the subject tonight of these 10 Bhumi stages, a good place to approach this is linguistically beginning with this word Bhumi. Now, Bhumi is one of our four great elements. It's the earth element. All right, so now we're getting somewhere. Bhumi means earth. Okay, hold on to that idea for a second because within the world of Buddhism, yes, they talk a lot about the four great elements. Yes, they talk a lot about Bhumi, the element of solidity, right? So it's translated as earth, but what I'm going to start trying to get us to do is to not uh, go all Asimov. Don't go sci-fi fantasy on me when you hear the word earth. It's not so much that we're thinking about a planet earth. We're thinking about the ground. We're thinking about solidity, solid, that which is uh, what would be called in Latin terra firma firm land, firm, solid land. That's insofar as we're talking about, about Bhumi, meaning earth, we're not talking about planet earth. We're talking about solid ground. Within the Buddhist world, if we were gonna go digging around kind of archeologically, linguistically speaking for the meaning of this word Bhumi, there's one very interesting place to look. And that is this very famous mudra, a hand gesture, a seal or a lock, but it is a particular mudra hand gesture in which the Buddha has his right hand kind of on his knee sort of, but he's actually with the paw or with the, the the palm facing inward, the back of the hand facing outward, the Buddha is actually touching the ground. And this is called the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. Sparsha means contact. If you're familiar with the 12 link chain of causation, that's one of the links, contact, Sparsha. And so this is the Mudra, the gesture, hand gesture in this case, of coming into sparsha or coming into contact with the ground, Bhumi. And so they call it the Bhumi Sparsha, the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. That is going to be the, the sort of the theme for tonight. That idea, that image is very much an image that I would lo love for it to stay in your mind. It, it, I, hopefully you have seen such an image of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree with the Bhumi Sparsha. This is also, if you're familiar with the larger kind of mythology of Buddhism, this is the mudra of Akshobhya Buddha, the immovable Buddha of the Eastern direction. So this Bhumi Sparsha touching the earth has a sense of immovability to it. Okay, so that's sort of our, a little bit of etymology and hermeneutics in terms of what the word means. It means earth or solidity, earth element. Hermeneutically, it's used within the Buddhist tradition to refer to this sort of moment of the Buddha kind of touching the earth. This is of course a moment of enlightenment, right? And so that idea of the touching the earth or that boomy, that idea becomes, well, this is sort of one of the ideas I wanted to start talking about tonight was, you know, this, these boomy stages, these 10 boomy stages that we're going to talk about tonight, they're a, again, a, an integral part of the Mahayana tradition. And in fact, there is a very, 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 fa very famous sutra way more famous than the Akshayamate Bodhisattva Sutra. In fact, I don't know if any, many, many people have heard of the Bodhisattva Akshayamate Sutra, but they probably have heard of the Dasha Bhumi Sutra or the Ten Stages Sutra. And so there is a sutra in the world of Mahayana Buddhism that is exclusively 
exclusively about these 10 stages. And, and if, you're, if you're really starting to wonder about these stages, then, then my long drawn out introduction is working, right? But if you're beginning to wonder about these stages, don't worry, we're, we're going to get there, what, what this means and all of that. I'm kind of just laying this out slowly for you. But there is a very famous sutra within the Mahayana world called the 10 Stages Sutra. And it, it is translated into Chinese many, many times. It's been translated in English a few times. Um, again, it's sort of a, a, a very famous sutra in the Mahayana tradition for articulating these 10 stages of development of the Bodhisattva or of the Bodhisattva path in that way. This 10 stages sutra, and I really cannot stress how important this sutra is within the larger context of Buddhism or Mahayana Buddhism. That sutra actually becomes part of, or maybe it was always part of, we don't know. So it either became part of or has always been part of this very large sutra called the Avatamsaka Sutra, translated into English by Thomas Cleary. He translated, translates it as the Flower Garland Sutra, or sorry, the Flower Ornament Scripture. Um, Avatamsaka, the, this flower garland, or this, um, it's an interesting idea. In fact, this whole sutra is about this idea of this kind of flower motif and in particular the kind of a garland so it's a, a, a almost a bouquet a variety of flowers this i this sutra is pretty significant also within mahayana buddhism um and this is where this is what i wanted to start tonight by talking about or, or saying which is that the Akshayamati Sutra that we're reading is the reason why I chose it is it's a very, very, very good summary of the Buddhism, the Dharma, the philosophy that you find in this giant sutra. <laughs> okay. And so what's interesting is that there's a lot of, there's a lot going on in here. It's very worth the read, but in terms of the, the voluminousness of that, it's so much, it's very nice to have a, a tiny little, like, what is this, seven, eight pages long? The, the little Akshaya Mati Sutra is like seven, eight pages long. That's kind of convenient, right? So I just want you to know that what we're going to be talking about tonight, even though it's buried deep within this obscure, <laughs> small sutra that's part of this larger collection. I just want you to know that the ideas that we're talking about tonight are, are fundamental to Mahayana Buddhism. And the thing that I keep mentioning that I wanna start with is it's about a kind of, um, you know, this, this sutra, it's unfortunate that more people don't know about this sutra and I don't mean Buddhists, I mean like the world because it's a tremendous piece of literature. I mean, this is like, uh, shall we say, Homeric, you know, proportions. This is Homeric in scale, this amazing sutra. And I evoke Homer and the Greeks and Greek mythology for a reason. This type of Buddhism, this type, the you could call it like, I don't know what, you know, Avatamsaka type of Buddhism. Indeed, this sutra spawns its own school of Buddhism in, in East Asia called the Qigong in Japanese or Huayan in Chinese. So this sutra is a world of Buddhism unto itself. And that world is firmly grounded on this idea of these 10 stages. So I just want you to know that even though this is again, from our little obscure sutra, it's very indicative of this larger um, type of Buddhism, okay? And the reason why, again, I evoked Homer and the Greeks and all of that is this type of Buddhism, it's very mythological, for lack of a better term, 
right? Mythos, of course, is this kind of uh, Greco-Roman idea, and I don't want to conflate uh, Greco-Roman mythology with this. But what I mean is, is that this, this is a kind of a new type of Buddhism, where it's using uh, story and metaphors and visualizations and all of these wild techniques. And if you are if you're used to these, what are called the Nikayas, right? If you're used to the Pali Canon, these sutras, as I, as I say often, these deliver information. These have information in them and you could read them about for the information and then like go tell other people the information. What's interesting about Mm, Mahayana Buddhism in general, Avatamsaka type Buddhism in particular, what's interesting about it is, is that they are sort of disguising the information in a story format. You know, this is where I would call it our, uh, uh, mythological, but it's actually even more uh, archetypal, let's call it that, if I want to use some more what kind of Western terms that way the the motifs and the metaphors in in this sutra the motifs and the metaphors are very um well archetypal in that way they you know if you didn't know any better and you know you're carl jung and you read through this you're like wow like there's a lot of uh, symbolism in this there's a lot of things going on here and indeed that is what's going on this is a very I would almost say mystical type of Buddhism, where they're going to be using symbolism and metaphor and stories to, yes, deliver information, but it's meta, meaning that the stories are pointing to something. And so you can't get hung up on the story. You need, you need to look at what the story is pointing to in that way. And indeed, that's how myths traditionally work, right? And so I just want you to know that if you're used to that other kind of type of Buddhism that's a little more direct, this type of Buddhism is going to seem a little different. And indeed, it is different. But from somebody who's done a lot of teaching of this stuff, I can assure you, it's, it's the Dharma. It's the exact same message, the exact same ideas. It's just a matter of whether you want your Dharma in these kind of mythological terms, or do you want it in a more scientific, uh, you know, like a textbook form? There's just a variety of ways of, of approaching it. Okay, so that's sort of what I wanted to preface this with is that uh, what we're gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit of from the sutra, from our Ratnakuta sutra, from our Akshayamati Bodhisattva sutra. I'm gonna read a little bit from it and it's gonna sound a little weird. <laughs> It's going gonna, it's gonna to be like, wait, what? And so I just wanted to prepare you for, the, for that, okay? Okay, now, now let's dispense with the preliminary, shall we? What are these 10 Bhumi stages all about, all right? So you, you, see, you see Akshayamati Bodhisattva here. He's like, Bodhisattva stages, all right? That's what he's doing. He's like, what? He's, he's playing the Shravaka or the, you know, the old school Buddhist where he's like, stages? I don't understand. Because indeed, that's the next part of the sutra where, where the Buddha basically enunciates or announces these 10 stages to the Bodhisattva Akshayamati. And these are the 10 stages of development of the Bodhisattva. But there's something very important there are many, many things very important to explain about these stages. So the, the, I don't know what is first actually, but I will begin with you one, one should keep in mind that the Bodhisattva path that Akshaya Mati Bodhisattva represents here, the Bodhisattva path is a very special path, and it's it, it kind of is about a very specific idea. 
And that's actually about becoming a Buddha, like a fully enlightened being. And that's different than following the teachings of the Buddha and alleviating one's suffering, um, uh, clearing one's kind of karma in that sense, purifying one's karma, purifying one's actions, not suffering, not clinging, uh, insight, wisdom, all of these things are part of the, the Buddhist path. Being a Buddhist, gaining insight, calming down, alleviation of suffering. And if you pursue that path all the way, they say you become an arhat, this kind of totally pure, cleared out, um, and, you know, that's the idea. But at a certain point, you know, if you, if you wanted to, you know, it seems like it's in the Vajra Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra, but at a certain point, somebody asked the Buddha, all right, I know how to alleviate suffering. I know how to purify my karma. I know how to do all of that. But what if I want to, what if I want to be a Buddha? What if, what if I want supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, as it's called, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? Like, what if I want to go like, for Buddhahood. And that's when in the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha says, oh, oh, you want to be a Buddha? Okay. And thus begins a slightly different discourse that basically from that sutra, the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra, from that point on, this Mahayana situation splits off and it is not just a tradition of purifying one's own karma. It's not just a tradition of alleviating one's own suffering. It's the larger project of, well, it's complicated about what these things ex exactly mean, but it's the bigger project of attaining Buddhahood, purifying one's Buddha realm, and ultimately liberating or enlightening all sentient beings in one's Buddha realm or one in one's vicinity in that sense. It's a different project in a way. And indeed that's where this, um, the language of Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva path, it's where it comes from is that it's this different project. And originally, if you don't know, originally the, the enlightenment seeker, the being of enlightenment, the bodhisattva was this guy, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, before he became the Buddha. So in other words, the, the name or the title, I should say, the title bodhisattva was a title reserved for Shakyamuni or Siddhartha in all of his past lives when he was doing the preparatory cultivation and training in order to eventually Bhumisparsha, do the earth touching mudra, defeat Mara, become enlightened, turn the wheel of the Dharma, all of that. Before he turned the wheel of the Dharma and defeated Mara and touched the earth, he was the Bodhisattva. The Mahayana tradition takes that idea of treading the path towards complete enlightenment. They take it very seriously and they basically say, oh, you want to tread the path to full enlightenment? Oh, come this way. <laughs> it's like over there are the arhats meditating in the aranya in the forest, entering their jhanas, going into their samadhis. And at some point it was like, oh, you want to be a, a Buddha? Come with me. We, we need to have a talk. And that talk is a talk about emptiness and all of those things. But I just kind of want to want you to know that this, these 10 stages are this sort of archetypal journey towards Buddhahood, towards full enlightenment. And it's an archetypal journey that yes, the Buddha went through and one can look at and read about and hear about 
the Buddha's adventures as a bodhisattva. But what happens in the Mahayana tradition is that those adventures and those teachings of the bodhisattva, they become again this sort of archetypal journey that we will all go through. And from a Buddhist point of view, we may not all be ready to go on the adventure. And that's okay. That's, that's the idea is that this path is not for everybody. But if you're here in the Dharma doors tonight, it might be, it might be your path. You, you know, it's like, I don't know why else you would have stuck through all those other uh, classes to have gotten here in that way. And so I'm hoping that this information tonight appeals to you in that Jungian, archetypal, mystical kind of a way. I, like, I hope you can hear it that way. And in particular, what I mean is, like the Bodhisattva Akshayamati, who's like, Bodhisattva stages, if anybody is in the audience saying, stages, Buddhism? Well, you need to review your Buddhism because there have always been stages in Buddhism. They love their stages. And whether it's the stage of the stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, or arhat, that, or those, I should say, those are the four stages of becoming an arhat. There are also the four stages of dhyana, where there are the four dhyanas of form and the four formless jhanas. And those eight, the four form jhanas and the four formless jhanas, those eight are considered kind of stages in a way. So what I want you to know is that this schema of these bodhisattva stages, they are, they are keeping it Buddhist. They're, they're keeping it Buddhist by, by being like, all right, we've got some new stages. You're used to stages. So I don't want anybody saying like, what are these stages business doing in Buddhism? They, they belong squarely within the Buddhist tradition. Um, rest assured, of course, that I believe it's the stage gone afar, as it's called, stage number seven. At that stage, you go beyond stages. So, you know, it's kind of fun, but yeah, but what I'm getting at is, is that this is this Mahayana um, way of describing experiences or stages of development of this seeker of enlightenment as they progress towards Buddhahood. And I guess the idea is, is that I want to try to connect that original meaning, which is the Bhumi Sparsha, that idea of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, touching the earth, touching the Bhumi, and that that is sort of basically like the 10th Bhumi stage, if you will, that 10th stage. And so these are the nine or arguably 10 stages that precede that moment of immovability. And I would really like to stay clearly focused on that earth touching mudra as a metaphor or sign or symbol for immovability. And that sort of and immovability is of course stage eight. So I don't want you to, to, I'm trying to give you a feeling for what this is all about, okay? Questions, comments, answers, ideas, really quickly about any of that. This, that's all preliminary. We haven't actually started yet. Uh, Noam and then Tanya. Um, so the Bodhisattva path ultimately leads to Buddhahood, right? Yep. It is, is it... <laughs> Is, is, is Buddhahood the last stage of the Bodhisattva path or is it a separate thing? Uh, that does get a little technical and tricky. The reason, I'll, let me tell yeah, you, please, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe you don't need to get into it too much, which is that the Buddha, once he was enlightened, 
he didn't just take off. He came back to to help other people. So it seems to me that he was still a bodhisattva in that sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, um, yeah, I, I think, hold on to that because I think I do want to walk through these 10, at least the names of the 10 and what they're kind of alluding to. And then that might sort of, um, yeah. Tanya, you had a question? Basically, basically it was very similar to what Noam was asking, so I'm good. Okay, okay. Okay, so these, I, okay, so I opened up a little can of worms there and that's okay. But yeah, I, I it might help. It, it, yeah, let me, why not? It can't hurt. It might help at this point to mention something very interesting from this Mahayana perspective. Um, what's interesting about this, and I don't want to go too into this, I just want to kind of like address Noam and Tanya's thinking right now. What's interesting from a Mahayana Buddhist perspective, there is in a way only one Buddha and only one enlightenment event. And we separate ourselves from that enlightenment and from that event through clinging to self and all of that. If we go through the cultivation process of releasing that clinging to self and, and all of that process, when one obtains <laughs> Buddhahood, the idea is actually is not that Noam or Tanya or Michael attain Buddhahood, it's that th that that event will now be happening again, or something to that effect. So there, it's a very kind of mystical idea, though, where there's only one Buddha, only one event. And insofar as we're not in that event, <laughs> that's a product of the separation <laughs> in that way. So yeah, this is very mystical that way where we're moving towards a convergence in that sense. Yeah. Okay, uh, cool. And I will definitely, like I said, try to wind that back around to that I clear idea of Buddhahood. Um, let me say, let me say if one, oh, there's so many things about this. You know, there, there's so many nuances to the language here of boomies. First of all, these idea of stages. I've actually, the way that I've drawn this, I kind of think of it more as a ladder. And I'm actually, I'm kind of going to, I'm starting to go off script here and I'm going to do this my own way a little bit. The reason this ladder imagery is very interesting. And yeah, this is this is really what I want to explain. So we just went through before tonight, we went through the 10 paramitas, these 10 practices or observations of the bodhisattva. And not only that, we went through 10 practices for each of those 10. And the idea being that the bodhisattva is working on their generosity, working on their moral discipline, their patience, their drive, their meditation, their wisdom, their power, their skillful means, their devotion, and their knowledge. So they're working on those things. And the Buddha has given you these 10 practices for each of the paramitas to sort of work on in that way. And I guess what we're at, where, where we're at now in the sutra, in all of this, is the idea that if you get to working on those 10 paramitas, you will pass through 10 successive stages of development. And what I'm getting at is that there is a very beautiful way in which all of this clicks together. And what, I, what I'm getting at is that you, you may have noticed that there's 10 Bhumis and there's 10 Paramitas and there were 10 practices for each of the 10 Paramitas. 
And so what starts to happen is, is that each of these 10 stages becomes associated sort of laterally, maybe that was, pun was intended, laterally, but they become associated with the paramitas. So the first Bhumi stage, this pramudita or extreme joy is associated with the paramita of dana or giving. And the second stage, the stainless, flawless stage called vimala is associated with the cultivation of moral discipline. And they go on. So each of them, so there's kind of an interesting correspondence theory going on with all of these. And so what that means is, is that it's sort of like, it, this is the way that I teach this, but it's very informed, very informed by the Avatamsaka Sutra. So I didn't make this up, but in terms of English language metaphors, I made this up. There's a way of looking at these 10 stages and their relationship to the paramitas. And it's, this is such a, a Buddhist way of thinking about this, but look, think of a ladder, think of a ladder and you wanna go from here up to there, right? And you think about the 10 rungs on the ladder. What's interesting is that if I'm below the rung, I would use it to pull myself up. But once I'm up, I would use that rung to stand on as a foundation, as the ground, as a bumi. So you, what, but again, this, it's so Buddhist. Same rung, the same rung on the ladder, but depending on my relationship to that rung, it's either something I use myself to pull myself up or something I use to stand on. And so the idea is, is that within this framework of the 10 Bhumis, you use the paramitas to pull yourself up so that you can stand on the successive 10 Bhumi stages. It's a really beautiful metaphor. Again, I really hope that you can kind of start to feel that this is operating a slightly different way. Again, that archetypal Jungian way is it's, you know, that if you're looking for like a direct answer to things, you know, or a direct, te how, like hold my breath for how long or meditate for how long, this is not that type of Buddhism. You're not gonna get really exact answers, you're going to get these really kind of more poetic answers in that way. So that's the relationship basically between the entire first half of the sutra, which was about the paramitas, and now transitioning to this part about these 10 stages that will describe the experience one goes through in the cultivation of the paramitas. Yeah. On that note, I want to say one more thing preliminarily, and it has to do with like, um, what does it have to do with? It has to do with, um, uh, Michael, what stage bodhisattva are you? Are you a third stage bodhisattva? And it's like, I'm, a no, I'm no stage bodhisattva. I don't, A, I don't think it works like that. And that's gonna, that's my point. So I, I've been, I have been studying and reading and translating this Avatamsaka Sutra for many years. In fact, I, I was looking earlier this morning, I had a, a session and I was reading parts of this with a student and I went to the very end, to the third volume, the very, very end of it. And I found little notes of, of myself from college. There must've been 20, 25 year old notes so I've been looking at this sutra a long time and been thinking a lot about these stages. And indeed, when I first started studying this, I was like, I can't wait to be a fifth stage bodhisattva or like I really thought of it quite linearly that way. And just to cut off any questions about this, I wanna just share personally my experience with these 10 stages. 
it's the kind of thing where I feel like I've gone through these 10 stages so many times. And there's a way in which my, my own education and edification and knowledge base, there's a way in which I feel like I have coursed through these and then realized I don't know anything about Buddhism and, have, and start all over again. And then really get to learning and I'm really, really going, I'm like, wow, I really get this Buddhism stuff. And then I'm like, oh, I don't understand this at all. And I, and so it's truly kind of, um, you know, that beautiful Sufi idea of spiraling up the mountain where we're kind of going through these 10 stages, but at different intervals, maybe tighter and tighter intervals, or like, I don't know what metaphor you would like to work with, but I just want you to know that I don't think of these things as so linear that way, that like one is locked into being a third level bodhisattva until they pass some exam and then are now fourth stage. I don't, I don't teach it that way. So just want you to know that. Questions, comments, answers about any of that so far? Cool. One last thing before we actually get into these. These are the 10 boomies, 10 stages. And again, there's a sutra just for these 10 stages. And this idea of these 10 stages eh, and their association to the 10 paramitas, that seems to be a, an original kernel of an idea. But if you read the entire Avatamsaka Sutra, you will come to find out that there are actually 52 stages to enlightenment. And in some traditions, there are only 42. And that's because there are these other 10 transferences of merit, and there's these other 10, they're called abodes, and there's these other 10 uh, practices. And what the only thing that I want to mention is that I have been struck by the repetition, say it happens within like Jewish mysticism, it happens within Christian mysticism, the number 42 in particular, with various stages of spiritual maturation, the number 42 pops up a lot. <laughs> and it pops up in the Avatamsaka Sutra. And again, they sometimes add an extra 10, making it 52. And if you're really into Tibetan Buddhism, the number 52 pops up a lot. And what I want you to know is that these numbers, although they may have, obviously may have higher Numer numerological significance and higher just metaphysical significance. If in the world of Buddhism, you ever encounter the number 42 or 52, they're referring to these stages of development, like sort of originally. Now they might do 52 fire pujas in like a Tibetan tradition where they keep these fire, 52 uh, ri uh, ritual fires going and they're feeding it offerings and all of that. And that's fascinating, but what's even more fascinating is at the end of the day, they're referencing these stages of development. So just had to mention that, that that's also, these are also part of a larger framework of, of that. Okay, let's get into some very cool names and some, and again, I just want you to like kind of open up that mythological archetypal side of yourself and like really just try to to feel what's being spoken about here right so let's go through these the very first bumi stage is called pra mudita translated as extreme joy this word mudita uh, you may have encountered it. It's one of the Brahma Viharas. It's one of the immeasurables, as it's called. And uh, these, uh, the within the framework of metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, mudita, usually translated as empathic or empathetic joy, be being very happy for other people. 
But interestingly, the word mudita means sweet or sweetness. So it's kind of interesting that the Buddhists or the Buddha likened empathic joy for others as being sweet. That's a lovely idea. And then the fourth immeasurable or the fourth Brahma Vihara is upeksha or equanimity. So that's our mudita, empathetic joy, being very joyful for others. And in particular, the idea is actually being joyful for others' accomplishments, being joyful for others' uh, advances. That's the basic idea, being joyful for others. But this is pra mudita. And you might be familiar with the Sanskrit prefix P-R-A from a word like pranya, right? So we've talked about pranya, usually translated as wisdom or transcendent wisdom. And that transcendent wisdom is because it's pranyana, it's pra-knowledge. And that word pra, it's uh, where we get the English prefix pre, P-R-E, or better yet, as in the word proto, prototype, the, an original type, pro, is where pra, or what pra kind of refers to. But we don't need to get too carried away with the linguistics because that idea of pranya, transcendent knowledge. So not just jnana, but pranyana. It's like trans, it's out of here. It's meta. It's like next level knowledge, next level jnana. Well, this is pra mudita. So this is like next level mudita is the idea. And thus it's translated as great joy or extreme joy. It, this is a joy beyond, again, the joy of just regular mudita. I want you to consider that what's being said here is that the first stage of bodhisattva development is a, a state of being or a stage marked by extreme joy. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Now, there's two things I can say about this. And I'm just, I just wanna say a few words about each of these stages. I don't wanna to go too deep into any of them because I actually want you to get, have a feel for the progression. And if we stay too long on any one, we'll kind of lose the, lose the flow. But two things about why, like Prabhudita, the first stage of being a bodhisattva is extremely joyful or extreme joy. And there's two things that to think about that are, I think are helpful. One is the qualities that are described in the first dhyana. When in the old school Buddhist tradition, right? The, the old school Buddhist tradition, when one entered that first, note, note it's the first, the first jhana, being freed from the suffering of the body, physical body, being kind of uh, liberated from the, the tangible world in a way, it is described as being sukha, ananda, pitti, blissful, rapturous even. So I want you to know that this idea of the initial stages of development in Buddhism, old school, new school, doesn't matter, but the initial st stages are described as being very joyful. And indeed in the Bodhisattva, extremely joyful. But there's one extra piece to this puzzle though. And that is what I mentioned regarding the relationship of the 10 stages to the paramitas. How does one achieve such extreme joy? How does one get to the stage of pramudita? By the practice of giving. And 
by the way, I just want to, I mean, I can't, I can't not take these opportunities. <laughs> so the Bodhisattva path says to that it is wise to practice generosity, a disposition of giving, a disposition, a disposition of generosity. And that that'll lead to extreme joy. But wait a minute though, society told me that I get happy by acquiring. <laughs> My society told me that I, I get to joy by acquiring and I get to extreme joy by acquiring a lot. Getting rich, getting stuff, like goodies, whatever, like, oh, interesting. So society is telling me that I will get happy if I acquire stuff. And the Bodhisattva path is telling me that I will reach this stage of joy by being generous. I wonder who's right. I don't know, but, I, I, but it is interesting to note. It's interesting to note that sharp divide between normal society that says joy comes from acquisition. And even if it's the acquisition of experiences or the acquisition of knowledge or the acquisition, whatever it is, it comes from acquisition. And this is saying, actually, that's totally backwards. And that real joy and extreme joy ar uh, arises from generosity. Fascinating. Totally. At any point, stop me. But here we go. The second boomy stage is the stage called Vimala. And of course, the word Vimala is a kind of, I, I have a particular interest in this idea of Vimala. Uh, there's a, a Vimala Kirti. The Vimala Kirti Sutra is where it all started for me, where I got very curious about this word Vimala, flawless or stainless fame. Is that Bodhisattva, Vimala Kirti, which is a very interesting idea to have stainless or flawless notoriety or fame. This isn't Vimala Kirti. This is just the idea of Vimala. And indeed, it means flawless, stainless. In some translations, it means virgin, but only in that sense of flawless, stainless, untouched, virgin forest type of language. Okay. And so that is the stage that the Bodhi, the second stage the Bodhisattva reaches, a stage of pure, purity, stainlessness. And one arrives at that stage through the paramita of moral discipline, of shila. And that's sort of very interesting because we're still preserving the a language of kind of pure and defiled in that way. But within the bodhisattva path, it takes on a slightly different connotation in this idea of vimala or stainlessness. Again, stop me anytime. Otherwise, we're moving on. Yeah, this, this will be good because it'll be really nice to hear all 10 of these. So I'm going to move through them fairly quickly unless I am, unless I'm asked to stop. So the third boomy stage, this is the Prabhakari. Prabha is light, kari, something to do with the body in a way. But this prabhakari actually means uh, it's sometimes translated as refulgent, luminous. <laughs> the idea is though, is that this, and I, I wrote radiant, but it it's like beaming, radiance. Uh, that is the idea. And in fact, that idea of, if you're not familiar with the word refulgent, but it's the idea of like self-luminous. So not, it's, it's you know, you, you start thinking about light long enough, it's interesting, but this is not a reflected light. It is a, a, luminous, a luminosity from within in a way. That is what this stage is called, luminous. And this stage of the luminosity or radiance, of course, 
right? This is going to correspond to our third paramita of kshanti, patience, peacefulness, tolerance, peaceful tolerance, patient tolerance. This idea of kshanti, this is our paramita. And the idea, of course, is remember that metaphor that that this practice of patience is the rung that we pull ourselves up to get at this level of refulgence or luminosity. And, you know, this kshanti, it's so powerful. It's such a powerful idea. It, it's about, yeah, it's like, it means peacefulness or patience. But whenever I hear that word patience, I'm standing in line at the, at the bank. And, and it's like, okay, just it, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. And it's this idea of like, of, of patiently getting through something in a way. And there's a, there is a, a hint of that in Kashanti. In fact, a lot of people have translated Kashanti as endurance. So it, there is a sense of enduring. But what is actually happening with this, it's not waiting in line. What's actually happening with Kashanti is that you are being poked and prodded, triggered by society, culture, everything. You're going to be called names. You're going to be tested. You're going to be cajoled. People are going to get mad at you. People might even try to harm you. And the teaching of Kashanti is to not allow anger to arise. That is Kashanti. It's a very powerful practice. It's something I work on all the time because I'm, I'm noticing myself always reacting, responding, getting worked up, getting defensive, all kinds of different things. And then recognizing this this little bit of wisdom. This is the wisdom of Kashanti, by the way. So let's say somebody's coming at me with either abusive language or even abuse. The little bit of wisdom here is to recognize that the, the anger that wells up from within it only affects you. It actually never translates to that other person that you would like it to. It never actually gets there. It always just stays right here. And so the wisdom is, is that even though you might think getting angry is helpful, it's actually not. But you need to, this must come from wisdom, not repression. We cannot repress anger. That uh, Freud, everybody knows we can't do that. But what we can do is from a point of wisdom is, is recognize that this anger is only harming myself. And my point is, and maybe this is even more to the point, the idea is, is that if somebody's coming at me, the anger is going to cloud my mind and not allow me to see clearly to know how to properly avoid what's coming at me. And, and in fact, if you look at it even a, a little bit, like kind of, you recognize how, especially if we're not talking about a, like a life or death situation, <laughs> but we're just talking about like, um, I don't know, more of a social situation in which someone, so let's say there's a social situation in which someone has really pissed you off, right? And now, ooh, the anger, the, oh, that person, right? So here's the anger only eating me up. It is not doing anything to that other person. But not only that, that anger it oddly keeps me in a relationship with that person. <laughs> and so if you were to not allow that anger to arise, you might actually just to be able to like 
you know, literally let that person do whatever they got to do. But there's a weird way in which anger sort of is, um, you know, this happens a lot in relationships, of course, too, where intimacy can come in a lot of different forms. And if we can't be intimate this way, meaning the like the loving cuddling way, we can be intimate this way too and yell, yell and scream at each other. It's intimate. It's a form of, it's a really interesting form of intimacy and you may begin to notice how easily they vacillate between each other where it's like, well, if I can't get your attention that way, I'm going to get it this way. And there's a way in which that, that kind of anger dance is a form of intimacy. And so you should, you should check and rat. Do you want to be as intimate with these people that you're angry at? <laughs> right? The idea is the point being a, a being, any sentient being, in fact, but it, you know, it's the it's, it's us humans that have real access to this. And actually, no, actually, I want to say that. You know, the idea is, is that, you know, bearing one's teeth and barking that like, stay away from me. <clears throat> and like even little baby deer bare their teeth and, and growl. They do it instinctually. In fact, most creatures in their own form bark, yell, bare teeth. And in their own way, they say, get away from me in that way. It's the human being who can actually not do that that actually has this higher self in that sense that can, I mean, this is what the, 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 the work of Dharma is about. We know this. It's about checking the greed, the anger, the delusion. And so in this case, we're talking about reaching an exalted state of kashanti or peacefulness in which that anger doesn't ar arise. And what they say is, is that if you reach that point, where you, you kind of have your anger under control and it's not allowed to arise and, and overflow into others, they say you become radiant, <laughs> radiantly beautiful in that way. And the idea is, is that nice people are usually <laughs> kind of radiant in a way and mean people are a little dark in various ways. Michael, has there something, I hope I didn't miss anything, has there something also to do with... Um when you live out your emotions that you in reinforce kamskaras is sans kamskaras is this a, in this context hmm. exactly mm -hmm. exactly and that's the you know that's the fundamental teaching of if anger arises and i don't check it i don't notice it i don't observe it and i just allow it then i'm going to samskarically reinforce that pattern of getting angry the idea is, is that if I do the shamatha, the calming, the stopping and seeing, then samskarically speaking, Connie, exactly, it's not allowed to perpetuate itself. And in fact, that noticing it, the noticing of it, that's the work. It's, that's actually the yeah, what, work. What, what I love so much about is that science is now catching up, right, with no, neuroplasticity. So... You even have a neuroscientific um, um, yeah, backup, so to speak. So, I mean, Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm. Thanks, Connie. Okay, everybody go with that, with developing patience to become refulgent. St stage four, Arkish Mati, a, a radiant mind. I, I just put up here bright. Um, it's a, it's an interesting idea. Um, so the Sanskrit literally means like a, a radiant or beaming, uh, arkish is like a light beam. So a beaming intellect, mati is uh, related to mind or intellect in that way. Oh, akshaya mati, our bodhisattva inexhaustible intellect. It's that same mati, but here it's the arkish mati. And the reason why I, I mean, First of all, it's just space on my whiteboard. But the reason why I like to translate this as bright is that, you know, there's this, there's a euphemism, I guess you'd call it a euphemism or something, but there's a saying in English, 
you know, that when somebody's like really smart and intellectual, we would say they're really bright. And it's a funny um, use of the term bright, that idea of a certain mind being luminous. So, you know, this is, you know, re we've, we have become refulgent at, in stage three and now stage four, there's this idea of this radiant intellect, okay? And this fourth uh, stage, this fourth boomy, it comes about through this drive or determination through the virya. Virya, of course, is a, this paramita we talked about one night. It's where we, uh, the English word virile comes from, this kind of energetic, driven, determined. And the idea is, is that that drive or determination, again, as a rung on a ladder, leads to the establishment or being established on this stage of, of radiant intellect or a radiant mind in that way. And one of the things that just comes to mind for me with this is, you know, you, th you think of these paramitas, right? You think of like uh, uh, giving, discipline, patience, determination. We're going to, in a moment, we're going to talk about meditation and wisdom. I often like to sort of just think about these virtues, these paramitas, outside of Buddhism. And I kind of often like to think about, you know, somebody like a doctor. Becoming a doctor is not easy. It takes, a, a, you have to give a lot of yourself and a lot of your time. You have to be very, very disciplined. It's very, very long hours of study, lots of tests, all the things. So you have to be very, very disciplined. Patient, I mean, you have to be patient and you have to have patience to be a doctor. But the idea is though, is that these virtues, right? And then being driven or being determined, the idea is, is that you can't just be like, you know, I think I'm going to be a doctor today. It's like, you kind of have to have the drive or determination to actually go through that whole process. You have to be focused, definitely talking about a dhyana or sati level focus if you're doing surgery or something like that, right? So I just want you to think about how these qualities you know, can be just factors of cultivation of anything. And then it's like really interesting if you're trying to cultivate Buddhahood, but I don't, you know, I don't always want these to be so esoteric or whatever. I want them to be, they're, they're much more down to earth that way. And the reason why I say that is that you think about it and it's like, there's various ways that if one wanted to become a doctor, and let's say, let's say you weren't that disciplined, right? And maybe you weren't that patient, but you had drive for days. You had determination for days. In fact, you were like, I'm gonna be a doctor no matter what, boom. There's an idea that that level of drive or determination, there's like that alone could do it. <laughs> And there's a way in which in this world, we see it all the time where people reach their kind of goals or dreams purely out of drive. <laughs> and like they might not even have any business being there, but man, they, they, they got there. And so I want you to kind of consider that that level of drive or determination is an interesting quality. And it apparently culminates in this kind of uh, luminous mind or bright mind or radiant mind in that way. Okay, everybody doing okay? Hope you're, and again, I hope you're just kind of feeling the flow here as we move through these, as we move on to the fifth Bhumi stage, the Sadhumati, oh no, Sadura, Sadurjaya, sorry, Sadurjaya, translated as difficult to master, hard to master. This one's actually very interesting. For the longest time, Sadurjaya, this difficult to master, for the longest time, I kind of imagined it was referring to the stage, that this stage was 
a, you know, fifth stage, it's hard to get there. It's hard to master that stage. But it's actually not what Sadhur Jaya refers to. So this stage of difficult to master, and by master, actually, they mean conquer. Difficult to conquer. So this stage, difficult to conquer, it corresponds to the paramita of dhyana or meditation, right? Sati, mindfulness, focus, concentration, samadhi, all of that's in this paramita, that kind of focus. And what Sadurjaya refers to is the bodhisattva who has mastered such dhyana, that they are hard to conquer. They're hard or difficult to master. You can't mess with the bodhisattva whose dhyana is solid. That's the idea, is the bodhisattva who has mastered this dhyana or the sati, you can't, you can't, you can't mess with them. <laughs> that's, the, that's the idea of the sadurjaya or difficult to conquer, all right? You know, and I get, I just kind of just to want you to kind of, you know, have a feeling for that idea of, you know, of why that might be. Why might that be that if, 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 if a being, if someone is, you know, very, very good at meditation and if by good at meditation, of course, I do not mean that they can sit for hours, <laughs> but by good at meditation, I mean that they are able to be entertained by their own mind for hours. They do not need external stimuli to be happy. They do not need that type of reliance. They are peaceful, imperturbable, solid. All of these ideas for me arise from the idea of being really, really on top of your meditation or your dhyana. And the idea is, wow, somebody at that level would be hard to conquer in the sense of, you know, uh, whatever, hard to buy off, hard to cajole, hard to convince, you know, to like, oh, come here. You know, it's like, this person's in a league of their own. If anyone is in a league of their own, if they're at that level of meditation, because they are in a way sovereign in that sense. So they're difficult to master. Doing good. Number six, number six, abhimukti, abhimukti. This word gets translated a few different ways, but this is the stage of manifestation or the manifest. Uh, this is a really interesting idea. This stage of manifestation, and in the, in the sutra, in the various sutras, I mean, there, there's a lot of different things that might manifest. Uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutis of Buddhas might manifest in front of you. Um, there's just this really interesting idea of the manifest or manifestation. And this Bhumi stage corresponds to the sixth paramita, which is pranya. We've spent so many nights talking about pranya, and even in the course of this sutra, we talked about pranya at length for at least one night. And we know, we know that the that the that a, a fundamental aspect of pranya is understanding emptiness, understanding codependent arising, understanding the birthlessness of all dharmas, all of these ideas of all phenomena being ultimately empty of essential nature and therefore not having come from anywhere and not going anywhere, that speaks to the so-called birthlessness or non-origination of phenomena. It doesn't come from anywhere, it just does, it doesn't go anywhere. It's like a fist that it is, it's present, but when I do that, it didn't go anywhere, nor did it come from anywhere. 
that sort of speaks to the non-origination or birthlessness of the fist. The teaching of pranya, of course, is that anything you could possibly think of or imagine or encounter is like a fist, a conceptual idea that doesn't come from anywhere, doesn't go from anywhere, but is just that, a concept for a present idea. I'm kind of pointing at what this word manifest or manifestation means, which is that if you really start to sink into the idea of emptiness, and in particular, this idea of non-origination, you realize this is all there is. This is what the Buddhists call suchness, tathata, behold, ecce homo, right, in Latin, behold, man, this is it. And so the idea is, is that when one really taps into that pranya wisdom, the idea is the manifestation, meaning there is only the manifestation without any before or after in that sense. I'm of course paraphrasing huge ideas, but it's what we do here on the Dharma doors, right? Okay. Everybody good? Very quickly, because we are running out of time. Number seven, Duramgama. This is the Duramgama gone beyond, a gamma broad or gone, gone afar is, is probably more accurate to a gamma, far or broad. Duramgama means gone, gone beyond. Um, if you're familiar with the Heart Sutra, the gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisvaha, gone, gone, very gone, way gone, enlightenment, svaha. That mantra of gone, gone is sort of speaks to this stage of going beyond. But in particular, what the seventh stage, Duram Gama, gone afar, what it refers to is. Of course, if we move laterally over to the paramitas, we would recognize that this corresponds to the paramita of upaya, skillful means. And this is a real dividing line. And I mentioned this when we talked about upaya, that this is a dividing line between early Buddhism, get my Nikaya, early Buddhism, and this Mahayana tradition. You don't hear much about upaya in the early tradition. It's there, it's there. But in the Mahayana tradition, they talk a lot about this idea of skillfulness or skillful means. This is the role of the bodhisattva as teacher, coming up with similes, coming up with metaphors, uh, teaching devices, pedagogy, and developing ways of enlightenment. That's all upaya, and that's all very much part of the bodhisattva path. It is not part of the arhat early Buddhist path. Because the early arhats, I mean, except for a few, they weren't teachers. They were followers. That's the idea of the shravaka or voice here. They followed the Buddha. They listened to what the Buddha said, but they didn't teach necessarily in that sense. They didn't need to come up with upaya. They didn't need to come up with skillful means in that way. But remember the bodhisattva is treading the same path as the Buddha. And so just like the Buddha came up with all these great upayas and all these great similes and parables and metaphors, you bodhisattva, when you kind of reach this stage, you go beyond, and this is the meaning of Duramgama, you go beyond the Shravakas, Pratekya Buddhas, you go beyond the old school way of doing Buddhism. And you have now crossed over to a mo this more altruistic, pedagogical, socially engaged type of Buddhism. Okay. Number eight, Achala the immovable. I've already sort of referenced this idea a few times, but this is the actual stage called Achala, the immovable. Again, I mentioned that the Bhumi Sparsha 
kind of speaks to this idea of immovable, unshakable, imperturbable, can't be got at, can't be triggered, can't be nothing. It's just totally immovable, solid. That's this stage, the, the eighth stage. This gets a little tricky in, in this sutra, the eighth stage, sorry, really quickly. In this sutra, this eighth stage of immovability corresponds to the paramita of bala, power. We've talked about bala, we've talked about bala. These are the spiritual powers or siddhis, abhinya, supernormal powers. And ultimately, I mean, I could say, I, I have said a lot about the supernormal powers, so I don't need to do that. But I do wanna just draw this connection between this bala power. And I said this, I said this one night and I kind of just, it just, I said it and it just passed by, but I would like to return to it, which is the idea of bala or power. It, it means like power, but when you dig deep, there's also an interesting way in which our English concept of empowered is, is appropriate. That one feels empowered versus feeling disempowered. If you feel disempowered, if you feel like subject, subjugated, then you are quite movable in that sense. It, meaning if, if you are subject to your landlord and the landlord tells you to move, you're definitely movable at that point. Versus this sort of stage of being empowered and then that being a kind of sense of immovability. And again, by immovable, I want you to know that what they're talking about is like imperturbable. Like nothing gets to you. It's just like, you know, and it's not, um, by the way, this isn't stoic. And by stoic, of course, this is, you know, stoic would mean sort of like just, you know, expressionless, stalwart, just like nothing. It's, this is not like that because bodhisattvas are not emotionless. They're, they're just not easily provoked and angered in, in that sense, right? All right, number nine, the ninth Bhumi stage. This is our sadhu mati. So there's our mati again, the mind or the intellect, but this is the sad mati or sadhu mati, which is our subtle intellect, the subtle mind. This subtle mind, this stage corresponds to the paramita of pranidhana or devotion. But, you know, I, I've done class on pranidhana and while, while it does have a, a pranidhana has a sense of um, Islam, surrender, Islam, right? In Arabic means surrender in that sense, surrendering like to a higher power. It, this pranidhana has that movement in it. It very much a kind of devotional surrendering to, but, you know, Buddhism's not theistic at all. It very, very, you know, they obviously they don't believe in gods. They know about gods. They know about other beings, but they're suffering just like you and I are actually. It's what's beautiful about Buddhism is that uh, the Buddha is called teacher of men and gods because the gods suffer. They just suffer differently. Um, in fact, they, they suffer from hubris and ignorance in that way where they, they don't know any better. So the idea here is, is that this surrendering, this devotion to, it's, it gets complicated because it's not a God figure per se. And it's actually, once you do the study, it's much more, much more similar to what you would find in kind of yoga traditions where you're surrendering to your higher self in that way. You're surrendering the little sense of self to a higher sense of self, 
the human defiled nature for Buddha nature. But the idea here is, is that the sadhu mati, the subtle mind, is not the, the mind that thinks it's trapped in a cranium. It's not the little mind that thinks it's in here and thinks it's whatever. That's not the subtle mind. But the idea is, is that you could access the subtle mind by sort of surrendering that sense of little ego mind. That's the basic idea of the sadhumati. And, you know, I hope that you can see as we're moving up this chain that this sort of this outward turning, if you will, is getting more and more extreme in that sense. Like that we are really moving from a sense of self and inside. And it's like, oh, I'll, I'll give, I'll be generous. I'll give gifts. I give dana. And then pretty soon that giving is getting more and more serious until we're surrendering the whole sense of self in that way. Uh, accessing or acquiring this subtle mind, sadhumati, and then finally giving way to the 10th Bhumi stage, the Dharma Megha, Dharma cloud, right? And this is where if I had my special effects, the thunder would, would start. And the <laughs> so beautiful idea of the Dharma cloud. Um, you know, it's funny, I was reading recently, uh, uh, I was reading up about the Dharma Mega Dharma Cloud, and it, it's so interesting, the parallels with um, cloud computing. And that idea of the difference between having knowledge localized in a hard drive or a brain even, in like a central processing unit versus a cloud version of data storage, which is decentralized, unlocalized, and kind of everywhere and nowhere. When you start to read about the Dharma cloud, so this is kind of like the cloud storage of dharmas in a way, right? Um, so that's sort of what's indicated at it uh, at this stage or this idea of Dharma Mega, the Dharma cloud. The parallel paramita is knowledge, omniscience. And this is the idea that the bodhisattva in the 10th stage, the dharma reigns out of their being <laughs> is the idea. It's, it's like a torrential just monsoon of dharma from this free floating cloud being. <laughs> That's kind of the idea. Which kind of brings me to Noam and Tanya's question about, so is the 10th Bhumi stage, the Dharma cloud, am I a Buddha now? Is that, is that Buddhaville? Mm, not really. It's the last stage of being a Bodhisattva traditionally. <clears throat> and that there is this, like, there's not a stage after it, but there is a, a, um, that idea of commencement, right? That, that beautiful English word commencement that means both the end and the beginning of something, right? There is a commencement up after the 10th Bhumi that is then one's uh, coronation, as they say in the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's the idea of that moment of full Buddhahood and I mean, arguably, especially because of what I said at the beginning, that there's only one Buddha event, it's very hard to articulate. So the 10th stage is the closest that we can get and still be dualistically using language to communicate with one another. Because after this, we would be Buddha together. So that's, that's that. Uh, those are the 10 Bhumi stages. Those are the 10 stages of development. Again, I would like to repeat that statement that in my experience, these are coursed through repeatedly in different ways in different stages. It's a kind of a very interesting map in that way. So questions, comments, answers, ideas. I apologize for running a little late. 
Wunderbar. Uh, thank you all so much for for being here and listening. I hope that wasn't too much. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Yay, 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 yay.